thanks for inviting me along. So, as you know, a little over 12 months ago, um, the, well, I think it was October 20, uh, it must have been October 2020, would it be post lockdown? It feels like a long time ago now, but there was a call from the council uh, for an operator or a tenant um, and there's a request for proposals. And as we understand it, there were three key proposals that went forward. There was a, a publicly documented and published um, social enterprise uh, from Union Street and Dina and Opus Independence that had a various different business plan and kind of uh, vision for Lears Yard there. Um, we understand there was a kind of straightforward workspace operator, so someone that hadn't been successful in their bid for the Carver Street building at 38 Carver Street subsequently put a bid in on Lears Yard. I imagine with little regard to the actual, um, uh, you know, call for the independent aspect and making it be part of Sheffield's uh, new city centre. And then there was me and James's bid. So just to give you a bit of history about um, that. So James has run um, various different things. So we met on a train, it's quite a romantic story. We met on a train <laughs> to London back in 2014 and we just got chatting and at the time, I was looking after the showroom and the workstation uh, within the complex there on Paternoster Rome. And James and his business partner, James, were just about to open their bar underneath Abbeydale Picture House, which is obviously another uh, old building. And he's also got the bar public within the grade one listed uh, city hall as well, you know, the underground um, public toilet bar. So he's, he's, he's got experience of working in, um, in older buildings. I've got experience of managing multi-occupancy buildings with several, you know, multiple tenants. So here at the Technology Parks, we have 34 different businesses, uh, tech, digital, hardware, software, across offices, lab space and workshops. Um, not a dissimilar scale to Lear's Yard, actually. Um, but what I don't know anything about is independent retail. So he's, his expertise from working in that sector are, are kind of coming forward, and that's what we kind of share here so I'll do the kind of business support and making it work and operationalize it all and foster the community there and Jim will be curating is a, a bit of a kind of lofty term for it really but it's actually finding that tenant mix that works so it's it's shops that people want to buy stuff from uh, it's highlighting the best of Sheffield and some of the most kind of you know um, when, when I say kind of premium i don't want to sound exclusive with that so what what i think we have in sheffield is a lot of people that create and make some world-class stuff but because they don't really have a premium forum in which to sell it they kind of go it's a it's almost a race to the bottom so they might sell on etsy or they might go to kind of pop-up markets and things like that and what we really wanted to do with Leas is, is kind of create a more uh, you know premium setting for more premium products and that's where something they could build their brand and hopefully um, kind of, you know, build a, build a bit more of a name for themselves as, as makers did in the past uh, down there. So that's kind of how it's going to work. The piece of the puzzle that we sit within, and I suppose just to put it into context, when we first sp spoke about going for Lear's Yard, we just thought it'd be a really nice scheme to do. You know, as, as I'm sure you know, it's, it's a kind of courtyard, inward facing courtyard with the opportunity to kind of permeate back out into the wider heart of the city scheme. Um, and yeah, we, we just thought it'd be a, a, an interesting project to work together on. But then as we kind of got drawn into the wider heart of the city proposals and city centre development, it's, it's become apparent that there's a huge disconnect between the kind of spaces and places that we have at the moment and the independent retail sector and the maker community and things like that, that, that actually want space in the city centre, but have never had a chance to, to find that. So suddenly became a bit more important for us. So I'm sure you've seen all this. I'm, I know um, you commented on the planning application, so I'm sure you've seen the kind of CGIs and stuff, but this this is the uh, front of Leo's yard. I don't know if, can you see my cursor moving around? Mm. Yes. So this is, the front of Lear's Yard itself, this is obviously the, the sportsman pub and this is where the Chubby's takeaway is. And this is the new build block that's proposed. It won't look too dissimilar to this, um, but basically the, the, the facade is being re, uh, retained of the sportsman and being extended. That enables us to put the licensed premises within the extension block and all the way along there. So it'll actually be one long block with a mezzanine floor here. What it also allows is, is a studio space on the upper floor 
And then just behind here, which you don't see on the CGI's, is where all the gubbins go. So our air source heat, heat pumps and all the other stuff you want to keep away from the listed element of the building will be built within the, the new build block. This is the new square at Backfields that's going to be created. So this is the rear of Bethel Chapel. Um, that's set to be a live music venue. Uh, it's not dissimilar to the lead mill, but we're quite keen to understand quite early uh, what kind of operator is going to be there because they reckon it's going to be kind of, you know, 10 a.m. till 3 a.m. kind of venue. We want to make sure that knits in quite nicely with what we're trying to do both here at the back of Leah's yard with our cafe and also the back of the new food hall, which is the uh, former Henry's bar near Cambridge Street Collective. So that's been opened by the Milestone Group. We've got shared license on this back square. So our, one of our key ambitions is to activate not just Lear's Yard itself, but the wider city centre. We basically want to build the narrative of, you know, if you're, if you're on your own, what do you do in the city centre on a Saturday afternoon? If you're a couple, if you've got some young kids, if you're out with your friends, what is there to do? You know, and you can already, you can almost say in Manchester, I would go to X, Y and Z. In Leeds, I would go to X, Y and Z. Sheffield doesn't really have that at the moment. We used to have John Lewis and people would kind of gravitate towards that, but that's been taken off the table. So it's about resetting that narrative and rebuilding what the city centre is used for and what people want out of the city centre as well. Just thought it might be worth sharing the latest plans. This is um, taken from a PDF uh, that we're starting to hand out to prospective tenants. And I've said to Stephen, I can share that PDF with you. Uh, it's not quite to scale and it's not 100% accurate, but gives an impression of what we're, what we're working with at the moment. So the restaurant unit, as I've said, is within the new build block, which kind of comes out along this line here. And this is the sportsman and Chubby's facade as it is. So that creates quite a nice sized restaurant and that'll have a mezzanine floor as well. Within the courtyard itself, um, we've got two shop frontages there and then you go through. The courtyard's going to be open kind of probably 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., something like that, with the occasional later evening opening. We don't want it to become too late into the evening. You know, you're kind of flanked by a, a kind of food hall and a weather spoons and things like that. So we definitely see this as a daytime uh, uh, venture, really. And as you come through, as you see, we've got kind of 11 or, you know, 10 or 11 small to medium retail units. The size works in our favour, really. So you'll see down here, there's kind of 300s, 400s, 500s. That makes them quite affordable for the independent businesses we've been speaking to. And just to put that into context, we've had over 120 inquiries for space for Leah's Yard. And that's drawn us into all sorts of conversations around the city centre, because obviously there's a lot of vacant retail space. And there's pent up demand from our independent businesses that want a city centre presence. So we're already thinking if we can make a success of Leah's Yard, do we kind of apply the same methodology to somewhere like Chapel Walk and, you know, build a nice precinct out of it? Or you know, are there are other pockets of the city that we could uh, kind of build. Um, you know, Eyewitness Works is a, a great opportunity as well. I don't know if you've seen the plans there that Capital and Centric are developing. So, yeah, so... But, I suppose the takeaway from that is there's a lot of demand for the right kind of product or vision or whatever you want to call it. So these are going to be retail spaces. This one here is going to be a cafe and that will permeate through between the yard and the backfield square as, as, as it's going to be built here. It's quite important to us that you can get that permeation because we want to draw people through whatever happens with John Lewis. And that's obviously kind of um, quite a, quite a big question mark as, as to how Leah's yard will work but we want people to be able to walk through and then back out into backfields and then the rest of the wider heart of the city scheme. Upper floors it's actually not dissimilar kind of layout first floor plan um, I'm sure some some of you will have walked around here what we are trying to achieve is this is a new stair core so these will be split up um, that you won't be able to get access all the way around effectively you will be accessing each area uh, of Leah's as separate zones. That's partly due to access. Um, so if you think like 111, for example, it's already quite a narrow unit. I've got a photo of it in a minute that you can see. So if you just try and cut a kind of fire compliant corridor down the back of it, it suddenly becomes a useless space. Historically, people would have shared the workbenches and it would have gone all the way through. So that wouldn't have been so much of a consideration. 
um, but that's the kind of reasoning we've got to that room. And this is the upper floor. So only a few on the upper floor here. Uh, 204 is above the restaurant's mezzanine, and that's probably our biggest unit at 2,000 square feet. So we're hopefully going to get um, maybe like a local design agency, or it's, it's going to be kind of 15 to 20 desk studio or office space, something like that. But other than that, all the others, like I say, kind of two, well, 100 to 400 square feet. So very small kind of independent businesses that we're looking to attract. couple of the photos that we've got so um, this is our kind of this is actually from our proposal that we put into the council so it's a nice mixture of uh, place and destination and quality produce uh, and also people doing stuff so you can imagine going into Leo's yard 50 60 80 100 years ago you'd have just been like absolutely bombarded by different sounds and smells and things all the different people doing lots of different things and we still want that so we're talking to kind of chocolatiers and florists and you know people like dressmakers and things like that so one of the one of the one of the viewings we did the other week was with a dressmaker and she only wants the smallest unit right you know i think she wants uh, 011 which is 100 square feet 130 square feet but she'll be sat in the corner making dresses and she'll only need space to hang a few of these things and the really high end uh, kind of products that she's creating. And as you go through, you might not want to buy a dress, but you'll see someone making stuff and it'll be active, uh, active space. So that's part of, part of what we're looking at for our tenants uh, to, to be doing stuff there. So just a few photos of the current progress. If you follow our Instagram, you'll you'll see a few more of these. Um, but we're trying to document this with pedal of photography all the way through um, because it's just we only really got engaged halfway or two thirds of the way through phase one. So phase one was the stabilization, um, you know, getting rid of all the horrors, new windows, uh, repointing the whole thing, making it structurally sound, putting new floors down. And then really that's your baseline build. And we've been able to influence the second phase, which is what we what our vision is and what, what needs to happen for that. So this is one of the upper floors. There's, there's certain sections here, like this water boiler, um, the, sorry, this old uh, furnace that's going to stay there. And also the, uh, the wheels are going to stay as well. So we'll clean, the, clean these up, plasterboard over. We want to keep as, as much of the exposed brick as possible but for kind of thermal properties and some of the bricks whilst whilst they're there they're not particularly in good condition so we're going to plaster over only certain amounts but there will be a, a big degree of uh, bricks left exposed so you can see that i mean the, it's a wonder it's still standing some of this you know these are all single skin walls as well you'll see so you've got to be quite careful moving stuff around in there one of the fireplaces and the chimneys that they found on one of the upper floors when they looked below to check it was structurally sound, they realized it was just built off the floorboards. <laughs> so then, because it's part of the listing, had to put big steels underneath it and prop it up, which is why you kind of see huge amounts of metal going in places like this. But This is one of our more recent shots. So we've had all the windows put back in now and they've chosen this color red. I think this was influenced by Butcher Works down on Rundle Street. That's a kind of Sheffield tone that's being used elsewhere in the city. So they've kind of gone for that. All hand putted individual double, uh, double glazed panes. So there's over 2,700 individual panes being put in by Craig. And, uh, uh, you know, talk about master craftsman, but his hands are just kind of like black sausages after doing all these window panes. Um, but it's been a, a labor of love, you know, and they've worked on their kind of rain and shine, really. Um, so that's been really good getting to know them. They're currently doing some work on the town hall because they've got their grade listed buildings, uh, certificates or whatever. And then just to finish off with a photo of our new sign. So this has been completely remade by the uh, contractor. And we've had a guy called Kit come up from uh, London. He's one of the last people. He's from Sheffield, but he's one of the last people that does real gold leaf um, kind of custom sign writing. So he's you know, if you were to compare this and the original sign, um, this just looks like a new version, basically. And that's kind of it. I don't, I don't know if that's enough detail or it, it at least starts the conversation to have a few conversations about um, uh, 
what your thoughts are or what you'd like to know. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, when is it all going to get opened? Is the obvious one to ask you. It's a good question. I mean, ah, where, I thought it where might we, be. yeah, where we find ourselves now. I mean, we're we're going through the kind of boring part of legals to to get our lease on Leah's yard. They're currently going through procurement phase two works as well. Um, so building up the schedule of works and putting that out to tender. So I think contractors will be back on site in May, and I expect to be getting the keys in late summer 2023. Okay. So another 12 or so months. Yes. Goodness. Okay, thanks. Right, I'll throw that open to anybody else uh, who would like to come in. I don't um, believe it. Robin, yeah. yes. So so, so I'll, I'll say... Uh, I think it's I mean I think what you're doing is, is wonderful uh, I really enjoyed mm. what, what you've just said Tom so thanks for that um, and I'm particularly interested just at the amount of demand and this I mm. this notion you've got of a, of a premium outlet I mean, it speaks directly to the way the historic environment can also bring in quality businesses and it isn't even as though those quality businesses don't exist you've got people queuing up so that's that's very heartening and says yes this you know that that helps us to defend the historic environment elsewhere in the city to say that this is the kind of thing you get if you look after it so yeah. i thought that's fascinating mm. so i was at peace hall with james doing a bit of research and that's a, another oh, great example yes. of um so that that only got through by one vote at the kirkley's or calderdale planning committee everyone else thought they should mothball it and knock it down and now it's a real world-class venue mm -hmm. again with a focus on independent traders now it's you know chalk and cheese scale wise but um you know, kind of ethos wise using a heritage asset to anchor your new retail and experiential retail of independence in the city center is um is quite similar so no, it's, it's good to see that there is a bad habit in this city um as well as possibly in the past places like uh, halifax with a the peace hall of just assuming a everything's gone and b if it hasn't it can't be dealt with and actually we've got some very very good regeneration in this um city the old post office in fitzallen square butcher works you mentioned in arundel street and of course the one people forget about which is the leopold street complex of five listed buildings from the education mm -hmm. the education complex which works beautifully now so you know the it, it we we know in this group that it can be done but it's I think, quite hard sometimes to get it across to others yeah i think there's you know the the word uh, viability screams out from your commercial property sector and we went eyes wide open when the council put this uh, request for pr proposals out this does not make financial you know financial sense but it makes city sense and it makes um you know like independent sense and actually if if you want to regenerate your city center you've got to have certain elements of it that might not make commercial sense, you know, in inverted commas, um, that props up your other stuff, that makes yeah. the, the new build stuff behind and your, your food hall and other places actually an interesting area to go to and a zone sure. to go to rather than just a one-off property asset. But Leah's Yard is going to make commercial sense in due course. Um, we're... You hope. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not doing this to make profit at all. So the technology part is a non-profit organisation. Leo's Yard is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Science Park Company, which operates that. So it's, oh, you know, okay. under the umbrella of a non-profit organisation. What yeah. we would like to do is make it um, financially independent. So they're not really on, relying on each other. You know, mm -hmm. if anything's happened at the tech parks or Leo's Yard, you wouldn't mm -hmm. want both to fall because of that. We've seen that model fail in the past for other people. Um, so yeah, it, it will stand on its own two feet and it should hopefully, um, I, I think the main thing is for us to put in any money that we do generate back into activation of the space. So we've got a, a kind of year long events uh, roster and activation. Okay, Joy. Um, I did a, a mock-up of um, tourism. Um, we have a huge number of makers within the city and courses uh, on jewellery, blacksmiths, etc. I think it'd be a good idea if we could sort of link those together and, and really give Sheffield a, a boost in launching Leah's Yard. Mm. Yeah, I mean, f for me, 
It's, so I've just been scribbling down, you know, we're, we're talking about bringing life back into Lears. This isn't going to be a museum. This isn't Abbeydale Industrial Hamlet. You know, this is setting Lears up for another 150 years. Um, and that's that's where we've started from. And so it's kind of looking forward whilst respecting its past. Not enough people know the stories about Lears. I didn't know about Lears Guard. I've walked past hundreds of times as, as thousands of other people do. Even now with the sign up, people stood looking at it as we're waiting to go in and kind of explaining what's beyond the gate. So there's a huge opportunity here to, and Peace Hall have got something so we're kind of plagiarizing um, this but you know one of their smaller units is actually allocated as a history zone with an interactive screen for kids oh. to do and you know like stories of the the kind of cotton traders then cloth cloth traders who used to go there so we can build all of those uh, Lear stories you know the the trade union movement in the first floor of the sportsman and all those things people don't know about this stuff so actually by coming to Lear's yard for the retail or the coffee or whatever it is they'll then pick that up as well um but the, yeah the other thing is bringing life back into the city center so not just focused on Lears, but focused on what the city center means and what people want out of the city center mm. and i think we've got an opportunity that few other cities have at the moment in that we haven't got a big arndale center or a bullring center you know we we dodged the seven stone bullet i think in 2007 <laughs> We'd have been Absolutely. staring at a, you know, a 10 year old redundant retail husk, you know? Mm. Um, so kind of, I, I completely understand people's reservations about kind of uh, facadism, um, but at least we're keeping the streetscapes within Sheffield and it, it will be an interesting city centre once it's all done. And there seems to be a lot of funding pots coalescing around the, um, the city centre at the moment. So we've got future high streets fund, we've got the renewal, recovery action plan and you know various different things which offer you know a big opportunity to be known about something so what what is Sheffield known for not it can't be known for the city that lost to John Lewis right you know in, in my personal opinion we need to forget about John Lewis and whatever we use that building for if it gets knocked down you know it can't be the ghost of Cole Brothers anymore um, but we've got you know the the gas Gasworks company is it uh, Canada House, isn't it? That's got the Music mm. Hub funding. Mm. We've got some money for Castle Gate. We've, I think we've got a huge independent scene, and like you say, makers and creators doing some really interesting work that just aren't showcased in the city centre. Um, and it's like kind of resetting what Sheffield's about, you know. So you don't want to go to an identical city. You go to kind of, I might be being a bit flippant, but kind of Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, Leeds. Mm you're kind of going to get all the same shops in the same places, you know, and I think Sheffield can stand apart from that. You know, we don't have a Pret-a-Manger. We should be proud of that. <laughs> we should be proud that failed and left the city. We don't have a John Lewis. That's a good thing. That's because we're an independent city and we've got better stuff to, to showcase than that. So that's, that's Matt, our kind yeah. of mind. Okay. Okay. Matt. You've got your hand up, Matt. Sorry, if I did, I didn't mean to, sorry. Oh, okay, fine. Did I see Graham putting his hand up? I didn't, no. Okay, anybody um, else? Uh, I, I was just going to mention um, okay. that um, Portland Works is a good example of reuse of a building as well. It is. And they filled it with little mesters, mm. making all sorts of little things. So, yeah. Very interesting building. And a lot of them, of course, were there before. And a lot of the campaigning came out of their fear of being displaced. So... Yeah, yeah, it's not quite the same because Lears have been empty for goodness knows how long. But you're right. I mean, we can do the Little Mester thing very successfully. Caroline. So yeah, sorry. Go on. I was just going to say that's been a key consideration for us because what we don't want to do is go to Harland Works and get the best people out of there and drain. You know, we don't want this displacement into Lears Yard. So we've got showcases for startups and support for startups as well as established businesses. There's a risk, you know, our suburbs and, uh, you know, out of city centre areas are doing so well, like your Sharabales and your Kellams and Abbeydale Roads. We're, we're kind of having a, if it's, if you've already got a space within a couple of miles of the city centre, this has to be an additional space rather than, a, you know, an instead of space, because there's no point taking the wind out of the sails of the suburbs and putting them into the city centre. It has to be additional. Yeah. Caroline, you were signalling, I think. I, I just wanted to add, and we, and we still have an Atkinson's, which is an independent department still. Yeah. Which is, is, is worth knowing. But just one point I'd, I'd make um, about the general scene on, on this. Um, 
I think you mentioned the issue of, of developing and training people. I may have made that up. But um, some of us, I mean, Joyce will know what I'm going to say, um, are really interested in finding some sort of facility in the city that maybe works with the universities or even better with Sheffield College that actually provides training in some of the skills which are becoming scarce. I mean, heritage crafts is the obvious one, um, but um, other things as well. And that then gets outlets and we don't have that sort of facility and it doesn't exist. It does exist in a, a few places down south and I'm actually in touch with somebody who um, has some knowledge of that. Uh, that's Nalin Senevratny, who you will know. Yeah, yeah. But I just, I just want to make the leave the thought with you that developing that sort of link with the people that you get into Leah's yard might be of use a bit down the track. It's not something you should be thinking about now unless you are ready. Um, but if you get that mix of makers, you know, I think there's, I think there's potential there. And I've got the other B in my personal bonnet is the old town hall which I've been campaigning about for about seven or eight years now um, and is as far from being sorted as ever. And in turn, as a regeneration project, it's on a completely different scale from what you're doing for all sorts of reasons. But it's potentially yeah. a very, very interesting one. Maybe you're developing some skills that we can call on for that in due course. I'll leave that thought with you too. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> It's not a threat, <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Right, does anybody else, Robin, do you have any comments you want to make? Or... Uh, no, no, I think, think I'm done, thanks very much. Okay, really Brian, Brian's Well, waving. yes, I just saw, is he wa waving because he's just put his picture up or is he waving because he wants to speak? You're muted. Uh, uh, I would like a quick word, please, uh, Valerie. Yeah. Um, I know what you mean, uh, Tom, about uh, different uh, cities having similar uh, locations like the Northern Quarter in Manchester, for example, uh, which I think is a really good use. Uh, what you've proposed today, I think, is absolutely fantastic. Mm. Um, you mentioned about uh, contractors being on site again in uh, in May, uh, and to some extent tying in with Valerie's last point. Is there any chance of uh, uh, requiring contractors uh, to provide? Uh, Apprentice weeks, training opportunities, uh, for example, your glazier, uh, which is uh, um, you know becoming quite skilled work now, isn't it? Um, I, I don't know if you've got any uh, any influence with regard to the contracting side. No. So the, the way the way it's worked is we've been appointed or selected um, to take the lease on, but the contractor is being sorry the contract is being delivered by Queensbury, um, and they have subcontracted to, to I think they're called RF Joinery. Um, as part of as I understand, and don't quote me on this, but as I understand, part of the tender process for any contractor working on the scheme does demonstrate kind of CSR stuff like that. So Henry Boot have got a big sign saying we, we've got eight, uh, eight apprentices working on this scheme and, you know, got photos of the kids up there and stuff. So that will have been taken into consideration, just not by us at this time. One thing, um, you know, talking about, the, it depends who, who we get, right? you know. So um, one of the things we want to do is, as I mentioned, fill the calendar the, all, all year through. We want, we want you to have the confidence to come to Leah's yard and say, I know something will be going on that weekend, you know, Saturday or Sunday afternoon, something, let's go there because it'll be, there'll be something going on. Already we've been talking to kind of, um, you know, the dressmaker wants to do dressmaking classes because not enough people know how to make dresses, right? So she's like, will you have a small event space I could use for evening classes? Um, there's a, a girl does knitted kind of, I guess they're like um, plush toys, but made out of uh, wool. And she's like, could we do kids knitting classes on a Sunday afternoon? I was like, absolutely you can, yeah. Wonderful. So actually it's the community that's going to be driving that and hopefully sharing those skills as well. You know, I'll be very candid. What we can't have is kind of metal bashers because that'll just ring throughout, you know, the sound, sound attenuation through the floor in the listed building isn't mm. particularly good, right? So we won't be having um, like noisy works. But again, could we find a kind of showcase element or a pop-up area for people in places like Harland Works that do the noisy stuff over there, but actually showcase and retail in Leah's Yard, I don't know, but that's stuff we're exploring over the next 12 months. It ought to attract them insofar as 
more people are going to come and find Leah's works, Leah's Absolutely, yard, yeah. than, than are going to stumble across Harland works. I know there are good things going on down there, but let's face it, it's the other side of the ring road. It's a bit out the way. Yeah, and visitors to Sheffield wouldn't go there, right? Exactly you know, you're, so. you're not going to be able to hunt it out, whereas we think, you know, we don't want to be too kind of arrogant about it, but we genuinely think through the work that the contracts are doing, not just us really, or not even us, people are going to be taking photos of it. It's going to be an award-winning destination. It's going to be in the kind of, you know, top five things to do in, in a northern city. It's, it's going to be that kind of place, much like Peace Hall is for Halifax at the moment. So we'll kind of grow into that and we'll assume that role, I think, over the next five years. Yeah. Graham, have you got your hand up? I have, yes. Okay. Uh, just a thought. Um, are you planning to have any video on the outside of the building, like in the yard? We could display historic photographs of Sheffield or even Leah's yard if you have any. Yeah. Or... No, not, um, not outside in the yard, just because actually it's not that big. So what we are looking to do is an open day at some point, probably, um, I guess, in the kind of, well, it would be summer now, we're heading into summer. But on the photos and the, the kind of CGI, it's, it looks a lot bigger than it actually is. Mm. So once you've put some stairwells in, there won't actually be that many spaces. But as I said, what we are looking to do is internally in the new build block, there'll be a kind of alcove where we'll have an interact, hopefully have an interactive screen with some animations of what it used to be and some old maps of how Sheffield's grown through the oh, years. Excellent. All right. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. But Stephen, were you waving? Uh, yes, I, I was. Um, yeah, just w with my active travel hat on, Tom, has there been any demand for amongst the prospective tenants for car parking and either for themselves or for kind of concerns about deliveries, that sort of thing? Because I, I, don't, I haven't seen in the plans anything about car parking. No, I mean, you, you'll if you if you kind of zoom out from our plans, we're kind of locked between um, backfields and Cambridge Street. My my kind of silent ambition is um, John Lewis ceases to be, and we can pedestrianise the whole of the front of Cambridge Street. Because actually, if you were to look at the streetscape, you know, if John Lewis wasn't there, you could step back maybe ten metres and look at the streetscape. You've got Lear's, you've got Bethel Chapel, the Bethel Sunday School, and the food hall. All of those facades are actually one of the best in Sheffield, and you just never mm. really get the the vista of it, you know, because you kind of back your backs against the wall, John Lewis. Car parking wise, no, um, we've not had any comments. I guess people who work in the city centre already uh, commute in there. One of the challenges, I think, for the wider heart of the city scheme is going to be active travel and cycle storage. And I know there are conversations ongoing with a um, Russell's bike shed esque bike hub or cycle hub, something like that, but. Um, that's not actually part of what we're involved in. Okay. Right. Ruth. Um, you mentioned that there's a way through, through a walkway through. I can't get my head around what's going to be behind that now. Um, is it this people's park or pocket park? Um, kind of, yeah. So is it buildings? I wonder if I can just get my, just let me jump back onto my presentation wonder so here this is john lewis so this is cambridge street and this is the new build block this is the back of lears where there's some buttress walls at the moment so this comes through um and like heading down here you'd get to carver street there'll be some new steps down to the right here behind bethel chapel that go down through the food hall and that gets you to outside hsbc's building um the new building there Pounds Park then is turning right along there. So it's on the site of the old fire station um, where Pounds Park is, if you can imagine that. In between that is a new build block um, called, um, the name escapes me, but it's it's like that a net too. Uh, that's right, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's just a kind of standard office block in between us and the park, but it's a stone's throw away. Good. Thank you. Last autumn, I led a walk for the Victorian Society around the Heart of City 2 area. Um, and let's face it, most people in the city haven't been in to have a look, much of a look as between the pandemic and all the building work. And we actually got to a couple of places and people say, where are we? I don't know anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, once it settles down 
um, and they can see the new pattern emerging, that will go. But but there's already very good public realm, as we know, in Charter Square, and just standing above that, I mean, it's really quite impressive. Mm. That's the standard we're going to get through to the new park and all the rest of it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, like I say, it's it's it's, it's redefining what Sheffield can be known for mm. as a city centre. You know, everyone everyone thinks Sheffield is kind of symbiotic with the countryside, which is true. But that doesn't necessarily support independent retail in the city centre. If people are coming, they say they've been to Sheffield for the weekend, but they've been staying in Hathersage. The the mm. kind of money's gone to Derbyshire and not Sheffield, right? You know, so the the Radisson Hotel is a kind of, you know, I, get, I, I feel like I'm being kind of elitist when I talk about this, but you get a certain demographic of people that stay there that want to go and experience the theatre mm. or the cinema or whatever it is. They have secondary spend, but it. You know, picking up from Peace Hall, one of their busiest days is Monday mornings because people go for the weekend and then they pop to Peace Hall to buy some stuff on their way home before the train. You know, so mm -hmm. little quirks like that should hopefully just add a bit more uh, life into the city centre. Tom, you mentioned in passing a possibility of an open day, didn't you? Um, Joy just reminds us that uh, oh. Heritage Open Day is in September would be a great opportunity i just would leave that thought you may have crossed your mind already no it has and we were trying so we started doing uh, guided tours for the tenants at the moment but still very rocky underfoot um mm. they've lifted the entire cobbled courtyard ready to relay once they've sort of the drainage out what we're hoping is the courtyard probably won't have too much work happening whilst phase two goes on because that'll be the new build block um, so we're hoping we'll be able to gain access quite easily. So even if it's just a courtyard tour and a, you know, looking some of the ground floor units, um, but yeah, definitely like to show you around. I think people will be biting, biting your hand off actually. <laughs> right. That's extremely interesting and a really wonderful update on what's happening to something that a lot of us were afraid might just fall down before the council got its <laughs> finger out and stopped it happening. Anybody want to raise any more points with Tom while we have him? No, well, that's, I well, can let you off. If, we can let you off the hook, but thank you very much. Thank Andy. you. Well, the best place to follow any updates is our Twitter and Instagram feeds, mm -hmm. uh, Instagram in particular, because it's obviously visually led. So we've got Pedalo Photography following us around um, as we, as this kind of big milestone update. So, yeah, look out there. Good. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch by Stephen about getting you down into the courtyard to come and have a look. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, thank folks. You. Nice to see you all. Cheers. Um, bye.